Excellent, and hello and welcome to part one of our Biocontrol Regulatory Masterclass series. It's really wonderful to have you all join us today. I'm accompanied uh, today by Putra and Dika, a program assistant on this project, uh, and also our facilitator and international expert, Dr. Roma Gwynn. The series is really an important opportunity to bring us all together as practitioners with a strong interest in regulation of biocontrol, to work together to help support best practice. And this is a real crucial area for biocontrol, but sometimes a little forgotten. So we're really glad to be able to pull this series together. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, we really appreciate your interest and commitment in spending these two hours with us. And I'd also like to thank Valent Biosciences and Sumitomo for their kind support in making this series a reality. So just before we start on the next slide, I just want to give you a bit of an idea of how to interact today and hopefully you can see that it's pretty standard for everyone who's been joining us uh, over the last year. Uh, we have had to use a webinar tool today just because we have uh, a few more people than we expected register, um, but we're going to just use the chat for asking all the questions, sharing all the information and really um, we encourage you to use that a lot and, sh and share as much as you can. Um, this is kind of important because uh, I think it kind of keeps it alive. We actually hear what are your needs and we hear what your interests are as well. So we won't be using the Q&A, you'll just see a chat, so just ask your questions directly in that. Um, you'll also see uh, some reactions, so you can raise your hand if you want to speak, but please don't uh, do so too much. We'll probably try and keep a little uh, time at the end for doing that, but you'll probably be able to use the chat quite well to ask questions. Uh, if you can, um, it would be very helpful if you could rename yourself if your name isn't up there, but I see most of you actually have your name there, so that's good. But you can do that by just clicking participants and clicking your name and then clicking more. So that's just how we're going to interact today. So, so please be um, please participate as much as you can and ask all your questions while we've got an expert here um, and we will try to get those answered. Okay, moving on to the next slide. What we really want you to do, and, and some of you heard this at the very start, is to please introduce yourself if you haven't already in the chat. Great to have your name, the organization you're from, so people know where you're working uh, and also the country that you're based in. So we get a good idea of the spread of participants in the room. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next slide now quite quickly because we've got quite a big schedule in front of us. Um, this is part one of a three part masterclass series on biocontrol regulation. Um, so we've got another two series after, or two sessions after this next Tuesday, same time and next, sorry, the Wednesday 1st of June, same time as well. Uh, so we're really looking forward to seeing you join us throughout those sessions. I guess just a, uh, a quick sort of emphasis is that this is really designed today to focus on regulation. So you, you're really going to have a strong interest in that in that field. Um, so uh, please join us and, and carry on with us through all the three sessions. But we also sort of understand if you sort of get through this and think, wow, this is a little bit more intense than I thought, um, then we won't mind if you drop out, but we'd love to have you keep with us because you'll find that different parts touch on different things that have probably a relevance of you. And there'll be a big range of expertise in the room as well, which is why we really encourage you to share your thoughts in the chat, because some of you will have lots of experience, some of you won't, but you'll all find little bits and pieces where you probably need just a refresher or you'd like to ask a question or where you could share something of expertise with us. So there we go, that's the big uh, uh, sort of ask to you. Um, I'd really like like now to introduce uh, our facilitator, Dr. Roma Gwynn. Dr. Gwynn is an internationally renowned biocontrol practitioner with extensive experience in the development and registration of biocontrol technologies. Dr. Gwynn has been involved in the preparation of the biopesticide regulations for Kenya and in developing regulatory guidance, including EPPO guidelines for efficacy testing for microbiomes, also the EU guidelines for botanical substances and antimicrobial resistance, and as an OECD expert in the preparation of the of guidelines. 
uh, for microbiome contaminants and secondary compounds, et cetera. It's a very extensive list here. And I'm just going to end with one other important thing is actually also help to prepare lead author on the guidance for the registration of microbiomes, botanicals, and semiochemicals for use in plant protection and plant health for the w for FAO and the WHO. So we're really pleased to have such a fantastic expert join us and facilitate this session. So Roma, I'm going to hand it over to you. You've got a big job. If she loses her voice halfway through, I mean, please be, please be kind to her. Um, but please also ask her lots of questions because I know that she loves getting every question you can think of uh, and she'll definitely do her best uh, to address them. So welcome Roma and thank you very much. Awesome, thank you for an exceedingly kind introduction. Um, just want to check that you can hear me fine? Yes, perfect. Okay, and I'm really pleased to see so many people who are actually interested in re uh, regulatory matters because um, normally it's sort of me and a few people sitting in a room on our own um, talking to ourselves, so it's great that everybody's interested. But maybe this reflects um, just what's happening now in biocontrol um, and the interest that we now have in biocontrol um, and, and sort of understanding why it's important. So I just wanted to sort of frame what we're talking about as, you know, we have the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, and it's like, we in the world we needed the what happened in the 50s and 60s to have this high input agricultural system of high input fertilizers high input um, plant protection products um, high input varieties but we've sort of gradually moved on in the world and we've we've done quite a good job at feeding the world but we now sort of look well maybe we were doing some harm so there's been because of this there's been a real interest in um, biocontrol and particularly about thinking of biocontrol in the context of integrated pest management. And whilst we tend to think of this as a new concept, it was actually something that was first um, developed as a concept and uh, defined by the FAO in the, uh, in the 1950s. So whilst we think it's new, it's not really that new. Um, and in this very simplified diagram, what it's just sort of saying is, you know, there's lots of agronomic practices we can take. We can do a lot of monitoring. There's a lot of other things we can do before we have these interventions. And because of all this interest in biocontrol, and we can see that the markets are increasing really fast at the moment. Um, yes, it's from a small start, um, but what we find now is it, the growth is beginning to be exponential. So there's a lot of interest. Um, initially, farmers were slower to adopt it, and that's because it's new technology, it's something different. Horticulture growers, you know, fruit and vegetable growers took up the technology first, usually because they're very good adopters of, a, of new technology. Um, and then they moved into the market. But now that we can see these products are beginning to be used in broad acre cereals, maize, soybean, these kind of crops. Um, and just to take this example of the European Union, um, we can see that there are products uh, by pesticides, by controlled technologies that are for you that are microorganisms, they're botanicals, semi-chemicals and others. And what's really interesting is that over 40% of the approved plant protection products in Europe are now bioprotectants. In terms of use, they're still used much less than, than conventional chemical pesticides, but it shows the number of products coming forward. And what I see is this is reflected in other parts of the world. And there's a lot of interest in farmers from farmers who want to have these technologies. So just wanted to just lay this down, sort of what I'm talking about, because these technologies all come under all sorts of different names. Um, bioprotectants, biological technologies, biocontrol solutions, all of these things. But what I'll be focusing on today is microorganisms, botanicals and senior chemicals because generally these are the substances that are required to go through a registration process. Whereas macroorganisms, they require to go through a different form of regulation and not the pesticide regulation. They're required to go through plant health regulation. So just on that note, um, when we've got microorganisms, we need to be aware that in some countries, there's a requirement to um, comply with access and benefit sharing and a requirement to comply with um, plant import and export rules before you get to the, regist the pesticide registration stage. 
the why growers taking take, picking up these products why they're interested is well the first one is because they work um the other one is they're very useful in ipm programs they're very useful for resistance management and for residue management so a lot of, we see a lot of farmers who will use these products getting close to harvest because many of the bio um, control technologies don't have um, residues and they also don't have re-entry intervals so um, improved worker safety is something that growers say they'll use it um, and they can also be used in organic production so in combination they're used quite widely so then just to, to line things up and so that we can understand um, sort of why you're here today and what your interest is in registration we've got this poll so what would be really great is if you just take a few minutes um, you'll see the polls come up on your screen now if you can just um, answer, click and answer the poll we'll give you a few minutes to do that um, and then we'll see the results of the poll and then together we can see who's in the room today and why people are here and what experience everybody has with um, registry uh, bioprotectants. So Alison, are you getting replies coming in? I am indeed. I've only got a few at the moment, so keep them coming in, everyone. We've only got like 10 at the moment. So there's 86 people online, so let's see if yep. we get 86 replies. It's, it's entirely confidential, so we don't know who's clicked um, and who's answered. So there's no, we won't know who has uh, replied. So it's moving up quite fast now. So we're, at, we're sort of almost halfway, so. Yeah. Yeah. So I recently, I did a, um, a sort of training session for regulators in the Caribbean. And I also, we asked these questions to them and it was quite, it's really interesting what, what replies we get. And I'll be interested to see if we have the same sort of mix of people here today. So we're just over halfway everyone. So give it your best shot. Remember it is anonymous uh, and there's really no right or wrong answer. We just really want a bit of an idea of who's in the room. So don't be shy at this point. Obviously, we're trying to make the computers work and finding their cursors. It's as much harder if you're on a phone and you've had to call in by phone, it's harder to do the poll, but it'd be great if everybody could answer it. So we're up at about 62%. Should we try and should we try and get to if we get a couple more, we can get to 70. Or 80, you are ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> it's also checking that everybody's awake. So if you haven't answered the poll, please do so. I think we, we should just get a few minutes, a few seconds longer, and then I think we will see. Okay. Answer. Still got replies coming in. We slowed down now, so we're down up to sixty-five percent. I think that might be a, that might okay. be as. So I'm going to, Roma. Can you speak a little louder? Um, somebody asked. So that's. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Is that better? That, that that's definitely better. Okay. I might have to turn mine down a little bit because that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit loud. Yeah, a little bit too loud. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. So we've actually got 66. It's actually pretty good to be honest, the polls, because, uh, good. and I'm going to share the results and you should see them. Can you see them, Roma? Yeah, I can see them, that's great. Oh, that's really interesting. So some of the people uh, who are listening in today have um, registered bioprotectants already. That's really interesting to see. Um, I'm really interested to see that some haven't done it, but there's a lot of you interested that you, this is going to happen. Um, I'm very interested to see that the split is between both applicants and regulators. That's great. Um, obviously, um, not applicable for quite a few people. Well, I'm really pleased to see that um, some of the dossiers even got marked as excellent um, because sometimes that isn't the case. Um, but, uh, if they weren't, they were good. And then a fair few needed extra data. And that's interesting because I think that, that that's twofold. It's one about training applicants, but also it's what 
training evaluators as well, because sometimes with new technologies, when the data that's provided is, is very different from what uh, you're used to getting for, say, a chemical, it's hard to judge, is it sufficient data? Is it the right data? And that's something I want to try and address today, is to what is the right data that you need to be able to make a, a good risk assessment judgment? So that's really interesting. Thank you very much for all doing that. So I think perhaps we can move on now, Alison. Okay. Lovely, great. Um, so I just wanted to put this up and sort of reflect a little bit. Um, so this is for bioprotectants and looking around the world, how long it takes. And as you can see at the top, you, the European Union, whilst it's got lots of provisions, it's truly not working at the moment. That takes five to 10 years. That's really not so good. But it's quite interesting if you look at places like Kenya, who's got a biopesticide specific regulation that it takes sort of one to three years. Brazil, two to three years, and often coming in two years, and the USA. And these are all countries that have got a lot of provision for biocontrol agents. And it's interesting to see that where they've got special provisions, the regulatory pathways can tend to be a little bit faster. And what I want to think about as well is that you, as there's going to be two things coming in. There's dossiers going to be coming in from applicants who have registered the products in other parts of the world, and they're bringing in a ready-made dossier. And there's going to be applications coming in from local companies, local innovation who started up, and they're they're registering for the first time in your region. And that's there's going to be a difference in those dossiers and there's going to be perhaps a, a difference in what you're seeing and what you might require them to do. So I'll try and address that as we go forward. I think if we can have a, quite a nice um, ambitious target um, is to how, how long is it going to take in your region? And what would be really interesting to have is to know if you can sort of um, send in how long you think it takes in each of your countries. And it'd be really interesting. We can, we can increase the number of countries that are on this map. So then starting to think about the dossiers and moving into the dossiers. So bioprotection dossiers, just like chemical, um, conventional chemical pesticides, there's certain pieces of information that we have that have to be provided to allow the evaluator, the assessor, to make a risk assessment of those substances. So you have information on the active substance that needs to be provided and information on the product that needs to be provided. Now, what I think you'll notice with this is, so identity is you have identity for chemical, but when you're talking about identity, say for a microorganism or a botanical, you're talking about taxonomy. Um, and instead of having um, chemical properties or phys chem data, you've got biological properties that you're trying to provide. So those are the obvious differences that we see. But as we go through, we'll see other differences. So as Alison mentioned, um, the WHO FAO uh, developed a guideline for microbials, botanicals, and semiochemicals. When this was developed, it was developed in um, 2016. And what we did was we looked at all the other regulations that were available around the world, both for specifically for any of the bioprotectants and chemicals. We looked at the different approaches that were taken. And what we did was we sort of thought, well, okay, what's a pragmatic way um, that we can develop these guidelines. And one of the things we wanted to do is to ensure that there was no additional registration barriers, because what we can see often around the world is that because these are new technologies and because the data requirements haven't been adapted, and because there's often not enough guideline, extra questions get asked, dossiers get left in the corner of, of rooms, um, and it's not clear how to make assessments. So the WHO FAO had a real aim to try and improve, to improve this and to streamline it and to take a simple, simplified approach. And as I said, it recognized there could be dossiers coming um, from outside of the region into it and sometimes developed by somebody local. What is clear for a lot of these new technologies is the dossiers likely contain a lot of information that comes from published literature and a lot of recent cases will be in there. And why is this? This is because these are often um, organisms that are really well known. They're the focus of a lot of research. So there's a lot of good information sitting in the public domain done by good 
uh, by independent researchers that have gone through a peer review process um, and they're do documents that we can rely on for um, preparing a dossier. So there's a lot of words on this <laughs> slide. So saying, um, but the premise of this guideline and I'm using as the basis of today's talk is that bioprotectants, uh, microbials, botanicals, semi-chemicals are indeed different from conventional chemical pesticides and they do represent a different situation. Um, and this is because the dossiers may contain information from published literature. There'll be a lot of recent cases. And there's also the idea that exchangeability of data is absolutely feasible. It's not necessary to rerun studies um, and that there should, should be good exchangeability of data. Um, something I want to sort of point out for, particularly for microbials and botanicals, um, and actually it's true of some semi chemicals now I think about it, is that there may not be an active substance on its own, there could just be a product. And this is because the way in which they're produced, um, and that if you think of a microorganism in a fermenter, you put it in the beginning as a few um, microorganisms, spores or cells um, as an inoculum. And then the, because it's so um, sterile and so well managed, it stays in the whole process inside the pipework, inside the fermenter, until it comes out as a formulated product. So there isn't a point at which you can get an active substance that you can run any tests on. So you may get dossiers where all the information that's provided is just about the product, and there's no studies that are done just on the active substance. And sometimes you have very, very simple formulations, or it's not, it's um, been used as, as a neat then you only have information about the active substance and the active substance is the product. Um, a lot of the formulations that are used for these types of technologies are inert or of no toxicological concern. And this is done deliberately. So that a lot of the, the people developing um, microbes and botanicals, and it's not to say that they can't cause harm or that they um, might, not, might have unacceptable harm. It's that the companies developing them specifically developing substances that um, will have a low risk that won't um, have endpoints of concern because they're trying to fulfill a market niche of recognizing that this is what the farmers and growers want. And because the active substances have no endpoints of concern, they formulate in very simple materials because they don't want the co -form to use co-formulants which have of toxicological concern either. Um, and because of this, so a lot of, for example, a lot of the substances that the, they're formulated in will be things like um, a vegetable oil, like a soy oil, a corn oil, a maize oil, or if they're dry, it could be in something like a talc, a kaolin, or something very simple. So they're inert materials with no toxicological concern. And in these situations, the active substance information represents the worst case. And so risk assessment can be based on this. And the other thing that makes these dossiers quite difficult to work with is there's very often no validated testing method. And through OECD guidance, through FAO guidance, they're still saying, but this is okay, because actually you often want the expert scientist to be working with the substance because they'll get a good result. Whereas if you give the material to somebody who's not experienced microbiologist, for example, they don't know how to run the experiments. They don't work well with them. Um, and it means that there's, there's two parts. So is you get unreliable data and you can't be certain if they were handled in the right way to assess them properly. So often when we think about the analytical methods part of a dossier, there'll be nothing in that part because there aren't any validated methods. But that's not to say that the work shouldn't be done to good quality. So something that FAO have, and many of you are probably aware of, is the Pesticide Registration Toolkit. And I raise this because it's, a, it's actually a brilliant resource to help, help um, evaluators. Um, and there's main components of the toolkit is a registration toolkit, it's an information source, and they have special topics there of consideration to support evaluators and actually to support um, applicants. And it lays out that you can have registration by analogy, you can have registration by equivalence. Now, equivalence is something that's much, much harder for microbials and for botanicals because, well, I'll go, I'll explain that as I go on exactly why equivalence can be difficult. 
you can do registration on resource rationalization about sort of saying, well, what are the key pieces of information I need to know and I've already touched on is registration for a local, local evaluation of a local um, producer. But really why I'm raising this is what's about happening at the moment is FAO pesticide toolkit has been developed for um, conventional chemical pesticides, but they're in the process of adding in information for microbial pesticides. So there's some semia chemicals in there and then hopefully botanicals will come later. So what you'll find is a lot of the information I'm talking about will also be held within this pesticide registration toolkit and be a resource that you'll be able to go to um, get support um, as applicants and as evaluators. So one of the questions that I always get asked is, um, and one of the things I wanted to sort of just touch on is efficacy. Because what we know um, is that all countries would require efficacy to do. I don't propose to go into this in great detail today because we've had already had some workshops um, through the Fall Army Win project. Um, so I just wanted to just have a little bit of reflection and Alison's just put up a poll. So, as applicants and as evaluators, what do you think the level of efficacy should be for a biopesticide or bioprotectant? So if you could take a few minutes now and fill in the poll, that would be great. So how's it going, Alison? We... Yep, people are going on now. And remember, there's no right answer. So if you don't know, I mean, have a bit of a guess because it's nice just to yep. know what people's intuition is uh, as well. Um, even if you don't know or, or haven't dealt uh, with trials or efficacy in this way, it would still be interesting to get your feedback. And Roma, I'm a little bit worried about your hand might start getting, you might start getting kind of cramp <laughs> in your arm or shoulder. I sort of hadn't noticed it was there, but yeah, okay. Yeah, but it, it may be okay if you um, leave it like that. Let's let's just try it. Let's I, again. I, yep. I'll speak up and try it down. Yep. Yep. And then people can maybe put, sort of turn up their, uh, their sound a little bit. But um, it could just get a bit. I don't. I don't want you to get arthritis before the. I talk uh, with my hands, so it's really hard not to be talking with my hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, uh, we've got some questions around whether the PowerPoint will be available. We, we'll, we'll share all the resources. We'll actually put together a resource kit, and uh, with lots of links for you to get more information. Um, and we'll share that, and um, that will be circulated afterwards. Uh, so we're getting some answers here. Actually, we've got 51 of 87, so we're doing pretty well here. So we're 90 people now. I know. It's uh, exciting to see this interest. And it is actually a really crucial part. I mean, it's, it's so important. So we're really glad to be putting a bit of a spotlight yeah. on this. It has such a potential to be a barrier for new technology coming forward. And for farmers who want to practice practice IPM it can be such a barrier so it's 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 really good that so many people are interested in this yeah and it's and it's really tricksy I, when I started with, with this I you know it's, I looked at the chemical regulation requirements and just thought oh this kind of doesn't ask work because it's twofold is there I wasn't being I was being asked questions which are a little bit odd for a microorganism but I also wasn't being asked questions that I thought should be asked so that's yep. why we need to make the change yeah excellent Okay, I'm going to launch the end, end the poll now. Uh, we do have a question here, though. What's the baseline for the assessment? Percentage of control or versus chemical control? Yeah, no, that's an interesting one. And we addressed it in the previous workshop. So when you're asked to um, prove efficacy, you're asked to prove the efficacy against an untreated. The chemical control is only in a trial as good practice to confirm that the protocol that you were using worked. When you're working with a bio control agent there's absolutely no requirement to say it works better or worse than a chemical because this is what does this product do in its own right and how can this be useful to the farmer so if a product doesn't give 80 percent efficacy that's fine um great so no see yeah everybody thinks it's over 75 percent well there's that's a interesting one because that's actually not true most biopesticides um manage um and now i see that's interesting so the regulators are asking so efficacy in a trial you should get over 75 percent most people think um and then the level that's acceptable in the farmer's field is over 75 percent some people say 50 percent, which is great i'm glad to see that and what the regulators now that's really nice that there's a flexibility with the regulators 
So what I was going to go on to say was that um, most, a lot of biopesticides will give between 50 and 70 percent, but that's absolutely fine. And what an evaluator's job to do is to look at the data and evaluate it, what level of effect it is, and then to help the applicant to write a label that reflects the level of effect that that product gives. And it's not in comparison to a chemical, it's a comparison to an untreated. So if the farmer did nothing, what would happen? He uses this product, what happens? Thanks, Alison. So hopefully, so just going on a bit um, then. So I think the other thing I wanted to raise on efficacy was, was do bioprotectants work? What does it mean? Because sometimes you're choosing a product because it works better in an IPM program. You're also choosing products maybe because there's less disadvantages. So for example, um, you're using product because it doesn't kill your natural enemies and you're trying to work in that way. And there's a whole range of other advantages. Efficacy is only one of the advantages. It may have the advantage of improving yield, for example, or it may improve the quality of the produce because you're not getting, say, so many puncture marks in your fruits because, because of the insect damage. So when we think about efficacy, it, it contains all of these components. And I've got a link in, on this slide, and I encourage you to, to, to look at it. If you haven't already um, seen this, we've already run a couple of sessions specifically on efficacy, and that's why I'm not going to go into details today. Those videos are available for you to watch it at any time um, and should give you more detail about what, how to do trials, why trials don't work, and, and just some considerations about efficacy. Um, and as I said, sort of on average, the efficacy that um, you get for um, biopesticides sits around about 50 to 80 percent. I I do sort of two, three hundred trials a year, and that's the range that I'm seeing um, for for a whole range of products for microorganisms and botanical. Some can can go higher, and I often see well one trial where something's got a higher level of efficacy but I don't see that consistently and what a farmer wants is consistency so I think it's better to write a label saying this will significantly reduce your population rather than saying this will control your population okay so that's really um, to summarize up about efficacy um, to think about what how the product works and then it's about Provide the information, applicants provide the information so that the evaluating officials can look at how to write the label based on the data that's available. And what's probably more important than the high level of effect is how consistent the product works. Good. Right, now I'm going to go into some nitty gritty about the microbial dossier data requirements. Okay. So, yep, um, just summarizing again, I'm going to look at all of these points. So today we're really going to focus on identity and biological properties. In the subsequent sessions we'll look closely at human health and then we'll look at environmental effects. So one of the things I want to point out is that um, I touched on it before and said you know there's often not methods um, and that's one of the difficulties that we have is that there aren't any um, guidelines or methods to be used for microorganisms and botanicals, which means that you need to have, the applicant needs to find out what guidance is available and work well and in collaboration with the evaluator to develop the dossier. But there are some um, test guidelines that were developed in the USA um, I'm afraid in 1998, and they haven't been updated yet, um, but they are still reasonable guidelines to be using. And you'll see a lot of dossiers if you're getting a dossier that comes from outside of your region um, and maybe developed in the USA or Europe, you'll see that they've used these guidelines for microorganisms. So when we think about microorganisms, here's some of the sort of species names that we're beginning to see um, commonly associated with um, products being used in biocontrol. One of the parts that makes it a little bit difficult is occasionally taxonomists meet up and the taxonomists do a great job of renaming things. So if we look at this um, slide, Gliocladium catenulatum is now called Clonostachus rosea and um, Bacillus um, subtilis, many of those now called um, Bacillus amyloliquefaciens. But this doesn't change anything except if the applicant has relied on a lot of data or so if, a, if an applicant came in 
um, with Clonastacus rosea, you would you might see in their dossier that they've also got papers included for gliocladium, and that's because that's what it used to be called, and those papers will help them support what they're doing. What's really critical about um, microorganisms, sorry, um, before I go on to what's critical. So microbial, you've got bioinsecticides, you've got bacteria, fungi, and, bac and viruses against insects. Um, What's critical about them is how they get into the insect. Some go through the cuticle and some have to be eaten. And then for the fungicides, you've got fungi and bacteria against fungi and bacteria. There's only just beginning to be some viruses begin, beginning to come into the marketplace and these are called bacteriophage. Um, there's one or two around the world and these are relatively new. The OECD is developing a guideline for how to evaluate those though. What's critical about microorganisms is the strain name. So whilst the species name may change, the strain names don't change. So it's really important that the strain names are given. And what I've got here and on the next few slides is just is all the strains that are uh, approved in the EU now. Just and many of these are also approved in the USA. And it's just really just to help to build familiarity. Um, with the strains. And if you look at something like the Bacillus amyloliquifaciens, you can see that there's four that are approved now in Europe. When I first started, started there was one. And it, we see the same thing with some of the other um, microorganisms. So if we think about trichoderma, which we all know, but trichoderma as many species, they were all used to be called Harzianum, and you can see they've been split into other species names. Um, and we've got many different strains of them. And when you're evaluating a dossier, it is the strain that's, that's important. Um, and the dossiers need to be strain specific. There's certain pieces of information you can read across. So for example, um, if we think about um, Bovaria, we know that Bovaria is an insect pathogen. So it doesn't matter which strain, we know it is always an insect pathogen. So we know something about its biology and ecology. Um, and it's reasonable to extrapolate on the bio, biology and ecology, but then you need to have specific information about the strain. And I mentioned earlier that equivalence is difficult. And this is why equivalence is difficult because you can't do equivalence between strains. You can do, only do equivalence for the same strain. So I often see people say, oh, it's just Bovaria bassiana. Bovaria bassiana strain GHA is different from Bovaria bassiana ATCC 74040. There's both, both insect pathogens, they'll have certain features which are similar, but they also are different, and um, that's what makes equivalence so difficult. Alison, I was just going to take a pause there because that was quite an important piece of information. I just wonder if there's any questions on that. Sure. Um, there are a few kind of comments that are coming in, and, and there, were, there was a question back, but I think there's a question here from Cyril around that I guess the farmers here and what they prefer, they prefer more than 75% mortality and some rejected botanical pesticides are just the same botanicals that can be, have the same efficacy with synthetic pesticides, but once they're seen as not being effective, um, or I'm not quite sure actually, Cyril, I have to try and make sense of this, okay. but I think I think yeah, what you're saying is that they them. will change their prefer preference, but they have to see that they're effective first. And so it's really important, I guess, uh, Roman, you, you'll probably talk about this, to, you have to really apply it properly. Uh, and that's critical because it won't work unless it's not not applied in the, in the, in a, in the right manner. That's one of the aspects, um, but I think this is what I was trying to say I, that when I said that farmers, I've done some surveys with farmers on biopesticides and their, their, their acceptability of, of working with biocontrol agents. And what uh, the farmers have come back and said that they don't necessarily need 80%. That's, there's a lot of people stick to that and advocate it and say they don't work if they don't do that. And particularly a lot of agronomists who are working in the field. And actually when you speak to the farmers, it's not true. The farmer saying, no, it's about consistency that we want. And if we know we get 70%, because you don't need, in an IPM program, you don't need to kill more than 80% of your insects. That's a kind of really starting to be quite an old fashioned philosophy. What you're trying to do is you're managing your pest population to bring it below a damage threshold. That doesn't mean to say you have to kill everything. And that's the principles of IPM yeah. is you're, keep, you're keeping that balance of populations in there. 
Yeah, good point. That's really important. There's a couple of other um, comments and questions in here. I get there's one here around. I guess it's just a comment here from Nepal around or Nepal where, where there's just not always good storage and transportation facilities. So biopesticides aren't always, I guess, the most accessible, and therefore farmers are sort of use chemical pesticides. Uh, yeah, that in terms of uptake, that's true. So when um, a lot of the bio, biopesticides were first developed, um, microbials we're talking now, when they were first developed, um, there was less experience on how to store, how to downstream processing them, how to get them into um, a sort of static state. The, the technology has moved on a lot now. And yes, microorganisms will, will need to be cold chain transported often yeah. and looked after well. You will see increasingly that um, provided you keep them in cool conditions um, and don't leave them in the sunlight, don't let them get very hot because they're living organisms, then um, they will sustain. And most microorganisms now have a two year shelf life on them. Okay. But you do, you do have to look after them. You can't leave them in the sun. You can't leave them to get hot. But you shouldn't do that with a chemical pesticide either. Okay. Least, so they're just unforgiving. If you do that with these, you kill them. Um, so... Yeah, and that will always be the case. You know, botanicals slightly different. No, most of the botanicals don't require cold chain transportation. Okay, excellent. And I hear I have got a comment here from Malaysia where the registration can take a minimum of six to nine months with complete dossier from the applicants. So, okay. if there's a good dossier, yeah, that's that is fantastic. So thanks, Leila. Where was that? It was Malaysia. Malaysia. Yep. Wow. And I'm impressed. There's a question here. Um, I guess it's really important to have that complete dossier, though. So it might be good to hear from Malaysia around if that happens a lot um, as well would be interesting. Uh, did any equivalence, uh, has there been any, is there equivalence, equivalence registration success? So are there good examples of that? No, because you virtually can't do it. So when I see dossiers come in and say it's equivalent, I, it rings alarm bells for me because the company who first obtained the strain, when they put it in the dossier, they say where they got that strain from. They say the origin, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't get it from that origin, have you got the same strain? I yeah. doubt it. So this is why I'm saying equivalence is very, very difficult. You potentially could take a packet and isolate it from there. But again, you know, you're taking something that hasn't been looked after as carefully as the people who originally found it. And is it the same? Okay. So that's what I'm saying for microorganisms, equivalence is difficult. And I see a lot of people saying it's the same as, and I, it isn't, it isn't the same as. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And that was a, that's a good question. And I guess just one question, maybe just one last question. Um, and I guess this is for, um, regulators as well uh, as for lots of people actually but is there a way to convince our officials that biopesticides are the way to go here in brunei it is quite a stigma that anything used to control pest and diseases must be as effective as chemical pesticides okay that's a really interesting question just before i go on so there, there is one case for equivalence so, so baculoviruses you can do equivalence there so if you've got um, because of what they are, because they're so specialised, there is you can do equivalence there. Okay. So I should have just said that. Okay. Yeah, now that, that question then is a really interesting question, because um, I started working in biocontrol in the UK probably well about thirty odd years ago, and I do a lot of work with growers and farmers, and I've spent a lot of time with farmers saying, oh, it doesn't work, it's no good, it's not any good, and the government not supporting it and not doing it. I think the world's changed now. The quality of the products much better um, there's more knowledge about them and farmers are much more interested to say well how do these work and it, this is sort of reflects this move to IPM how you convince governments well in Kenya one of the ways that governments were convinced is that the Kenyan um, horticulture export market is very valuable um, and they were being pushed by consumers to have no pesticide residue. So one of the ways they managed that was moved across to IPM and used by a control agents. Mm -hmm. And they had no regulation um, to do that. So they worked with government to develop a regulation. And very interestingly, in one weekend, they wrote their regulation and it was implemented into law within six months. And that was Fantastic. because that was the growers saying, we really need these products. So what I'd encourage, I think the growers' voice is often a really strong voice for talking to government. 
Excellent. Thanks, Roman. That's that's and that I think that leaves it on a good point, that section as well. It's a it's a really powerful statement. Thank you. Good. Okay. So um, the other thing about microorganisms, um, so and this is really important for evaluators to know this. So microorganisms are produced um, by solid state. And what, what I mean by that is they'll be produced on, say, like a rice grain or a rye grain that's sterilized. And then it's inoculated with the microorganism. And then that's either grown in a small bag or on a tray in a controlled temperature conditions. Um, and then when it, the all the nutrients have moved up, used up, and it's finished growing. The spores are then extracted. Now, some people extract the spores by drying everything and then shaking the spores off. Some people wash the spores off. But some people will also take all of that rice with all the microorganisms in it and use that as a product. As a regulator, depending which of those you've got will tell you something about what your microorganism is. So if you've just taken the spores, you're unlikely to have any secondary compounds present. So all microorganisms produce secondary compounds. It's how they operate. It's what they do for their biology. Some of those secondary compounds have the potential to be toxic. So if they're present in the active substance, you need to have some thinking about are they present and are they toxic? But if you've got spores only, of course, you can't have metabolites, so they can't be toxic. And then if you've got liquid um, fermentation, it's very similar. This is mainly for bacteria. Similar idea. These go into a big fermenter. And some companies take everything out of the fermenter and formulate it. And some companies take everything out of the fermenter, wash it, dry it, and then have just got spores only. And in all these cases, you can be formulated in dry or you can be formulated wet, um, different forms. But for the evaluator, it's really useful to know, and this is a, a requirement in the dossier in the confidential section, is how did you produce it? Because it helps you as an evaluator understand what might be in that uh, microorganism that came out the end. And what comes out at the end is for microorganisms, the active substance is often called an MPCP, so it's microbial pest control active or microbial pest control product. And it's described as that because it's not just going to be the spores, it could be the spores, secondary compounds, bits of media that's left over, some dead cells, and all of those different things in there. And so we use this collective word of microbial pest control agent. So you'll see the term MPCA used lots. And I really defined that quite well in the WHO document. So you'll see a definition of that to give more detail around that. And that, right. So thinking about um, the identity and composition. Now for chemistry, this is relatively easy. For microorganisms, it's quite a different thing that we have to do. So, um, one of the things that you must provide as an applicant and the evaluator wants to see is a really good taxonomic description of this and the species to strain level of the microbial pest control agent. So this can be, this is recommended to be done through the best available technique. Now this used to be putting on plates and following traditional classical Burgess manual for identification. Nowadays, of course, everybody uses a form of molecular technique. Now, the exact technique that somebody will use depends on the research that's been done for that species. So uh, most uh, commonly, it's the ITS region. And what you're doing is you follow the same method to get the same cuts of, of, of your gene and your microorganism genetic profile. And then you match those cuts against libraries against the type species. And from that, you build up a phylogenetic tree of um, your, the identity of your microorganism. And that will give you the identity at species level, but it will also show that your strain sits separately from the other species. Um, there are, certain labs who are good at doing this and others who are not. And this is where I said there's no GLP method for this. This is about this being done well with the best lab and the applicant should explain why they chose the lab who did it. They should explain their technique well. They should be able to reference that this is a published method that they used. Um, and they should also, when they show a phylogenetic tree, which is exactly what it sounds like, it's a tree, they should show where their species sits relative to the type species. And it's really good to have other species of the, the same species in there to show what the identity is. 
And the other part that this also tells you is by showing it's closely related, so a trichoderma is closely related to other trichodermas, it shows you it's not a human pathogen as well. And that's really important because you, you, should, you can't register a human pathogen. It is possible to use some read across to other strains of the same species to support recent cases. So I've mentioned earlier that Bovaria are insect pathogens. So it's quite reasonable to say, well, this is what my Bovaria does, but this is what all Bovaria does. They're all insect pathogens. So that's quite re reasonable. Um, but none of that case can be built up. None of that can be done unless you have really good quality taxonomic description and identity. I just want to pause because I would expect there may be some questions on this point. So is there anything anyone wants to ask? Not yet, uh, Roma, um, but um, we've got a more specific one, but I think that we'll, we'll leave that one around specific insects, um, okay. et cetera. Um, but if anyone has a question, please uh, please put it in. And, and also, if you've got experience in this, it would be good to hear what your experience is. So, you know, tell us if you've done this uh, and tell us if there were any difficulties that you had or was it easy? Um, that would be really interesting. It'd be interesting to see uh, from both perspectives. There is one here that is, so is the taxonomy test a must in submitting a dossier? Absolutely. There's, for a microorganism, you cannot make any assessment unless you absolutely know what species and strain it is. It, it, it's completely unequivocal. Um, and the reason for this is that a lot of the dossier is built on um, a sort of tiered approach and you can't build a tiered approach unless you know what it is. The first question you have to ask is, what is this? What have I got in my hands? Based on that, you can then start to work out what kind of risk assessment you're gonna to need to do. Because um, if it's an insect pathogen or is it gonna work against plant pathogens? Um, if it's an insect pathogen, you know, you can start to think where they'd be placing that in the environment. If it's a plant pathogen, it might be on the, in the soil, it might be on the leaves. And we start to understand from this good identity, we, we understand then the biology and mode of action, which is the next part of the dossier as well. So yeah, it, you cannot put forward a dossier without good identity. And I think molecular techniques are now so widely available and they're not expensive that there's no reason to not to use good molecular taxonomic techniques. And it's so important to get the identity correct. Right, thanks Roma. Oh, there's one question here. How about proving it through secondary metabolites levels? Yeah, so when you go through the dossier, you have always got to think about the microorganism and any secondary metabolites or secondary compounds that are produced. But it's not about identifying all the secondary compounds. It's about knowing when you've got secondary compounds that are toxicologically relevant. Hmm. And if the, if the secondary compound is not present in the active substance, um, then you, you've got a different, you, you've only got in situ production. And in situ production is usually actually very small. So it's only when you have the secondary compounds that are present in the active substance that we need to be concerned about. Um, and Yes, you need to look to see if, well, you need to have considered our secondary compounds present. And there's two ways to do that. One way is by the production method, which I described before. If you've only got spores only, it's quite, it's quite reasonable to say, well, I'm not going to have secondary compounds present because I've just got the spores. There's nothing else living in there. Yep. If you've taken a total fermented product, then you could have secondary compounds present. But as I'll talk about in the next sessions on human um, safety, is if your those secondary compounds are present in your active substance and you run your human safety tests, you've you've tested it, including the secondary compounds. So if you have no adverse endpoints when you do those tests, it must mean that your secondary compounds are not toxic. Okay. So you do have to consider them. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so. I've already mentioned that as well as the identity, what sits alongside the identity is the details about the production method for the reasons that I've described. Um, and what you've also got to look for um, then in production methods is to ensure that there's no human pathogens present. So this is where it's different from microorganisms. So there's an OECD issue paper 
uh, number 65, which discusses this. There is no specific guidance around the world, but this, this OECD issue paper is a standard that most people work to. And essentially what it says is you should really have an absence of any human pathogen. So it's really hard when you're growing microorganisms to keep them clean, but they have to be kept clean because none of us want to be responsible for spraying a product which actually contains human pathogens. So one of the parts of that identity and composition, as opposed to specification, now this is composition, is that you have an absence of human pathogens. Um, so you have to detail your production method, you detail that you don't have human pathogens and, they, and you do a study to, to confirm that. Um, that's it, virtually the only way you can do that is you actually commission a study. And then the composition. Now, depending on the microorganisms, there's lots of different ways of describing the microorganism. So some people will directly count spores. Some people will count the what grows on an agar plate under standard methods. Um, and some people will also look at germination. The most common one is counting cell numbers. So this is colony forming units. So that's the number of uh, microbial colonies that will grow on a plate. Um, other people will do it by counting the number of spores that are there. Um, but there is also the other option of doing biopotency. Um, and so this is essentially a standardized bioassay. The best standardized bioassays have been developed by, for the Bacillus thuringiensis, as the BTs. And there's also a really good webinar that happened this week um, by Daniel Zomek talking about biopotency and what they did for BT was they developed a sort of global ring testing and they all checked each other's protocols and came up with an international standard. That isn't available for some other microorganisms. So if we think about baculoviruses, so baculoviruses only infect insects. They're very, very specific to the insect. Um, and the only, they don't grow on plates, they don't grow anywhere, they only grow in vivo. So you can't, uh, it's that you can potentially count them, but the best way to test them is perhaps with a bioassay. And that's a standardized bioassay. And what you need is the applicant to have a really good standard operating procedure and practice and evidence that they're following a good standard bioassay and that you'd be looking at the evidence across several assays. Um, so you, this is a five, this composition is done by five batch analysis. So this is confirmed um, you, ideally by an independent laboratory. Sometimes that's difficult because the microorganisms are hard to work with, but ideally you should be going for independent laboratory. And it is possible there are some labs who do this to GLP, but it is quite hard sometimes with some microorganisms to find a GLP lab that has a competence to test. But what you'd really want to do is perhaps not the applicant do it themselves, but the applicant to give it to a university who's specialist in this and do it for them. And as was the question that was raised is, um, if you've got the spent fermentation media with secondary compounds, if you had an adverse result in your human safety testing, then you would want to find out what secondary compounds were present and quantify them, but only if they have toxicity. And I see some more questions have popped up, Alison. No, that's mostly um, just okay. going great. And it, um, I'll, okay. just, I'll just tell everyone as well that we'll share a link to all these resources um, that uh, Roma has um, pointed to, um, uh, guidance documents, et cetera, with you all after the session. So we, we, we'll create that resource for you uh, and yeah. share. So, yeah, yeah. And as I said, in time, this will also be in the FAO Pesticide Toolkit yep. to support you all. Excellent. But remembering a lot of what I'm saying is already in the guidance, um, the FAO guidance, and in some of these other guidance. Great, thank you. So I know I'm going through a lot today, and it's probably read this, read the guidance, and then run the session again. And we can do that if we need to. Okay. Okay, so we had a good question earlier, which sort of says, you know, can, can you proceed with a microbial dossier without identification? Absolutely not. And that's the reason for that is one of the most important parts of the dossier is the biological properties. This replaces what would be the PhysChem section of the dossier. And in this part, it's really important for the applicants to provide really good quality information. Um, and that's clearly laid out so the evaluators can find this information. So the first thing is the origin of the isolate. So where did you find it? Did you find it in an insect? Did you find it on a tree? Um, where, where did you find it? What's its, what's its habitat? What's 
does it do? How did you isolate this? Um, how, do you, how have you looked after that strain? Because you want to be sure that what you took from that insect from the beginning is what you're still working on today. Um, so you should maintain your lab books and your paperwork. And even if it's only a photocopy of your lab book of what you did, that keep that or ideally it should be written up in a report. So you have a good paper trail of what you found. And then as evaluators, you can see that good paper trail so that you can say, OK, yeah, I can see that this was somebody's research project. They went out to the field, they collected soil and they brought, brought it back or somebody picked up an insect and they found it in the insect because it, it didn't look very well. So also look at um, information, historical information, sort of what do we know about all of these species? What do we know about the trichodermis? What do we know about the bovarias? What do we know about bacula viruses? Um, and, and how is that relevant to what I understand my species and strain to be using? Um, and then there's a the question about whether the species is indigenous, because most countries have the rule that if the species now not strain the species is non-indigenous it can't be released so you want to also provide evidence that that species is indigenous now most of the microorganisms that people are working with are indigenous because they're really really common they're found the strains vary but the species don't so that's that information needs to be provided and thought through well um then also if again this is natu natural occurrence where did you find it in terms of geography? Which parts of the world is it found in? So this is literature review, it's just looking at the literature and saying, what does the literature tell me about where this um, species comes from? What's its, what are the hosts do we tend to find it in? What's the habitat? You know, is it water? Is it soil? Is it on plants? Um, and sort of if possible, and this is really, really hard to find, is, is just how much is in the environment. So we know that the environment is stuffed full of microorganisms. Um, so I think uh, a gram of soil contains something like 20 billion CFUs of microorganisms. So we know there's microorganisms everywhere. Every breath we take, there's microorganisms. The vast majority of microorganisms are not human pathogens. They do nothing to us. It doesn't, they won't cause us any, any harm. Um, and we know which are the human pathogens. So we, what we're trying to find out is the natural occurrence. So when you so we know that trichoderm is common, common in soil we know that bovarias are common so that when you release it you're still saying am i adding significantly to the levels that are already there or am i and the, usually the answer is not most um microorganisms are used at a rate which is similar to background levels or which the microorganism reduces to background levels relatively quickly then there should be good information about the life cycle of the microorganism um, thinking about what its target host range. So um, will it kill, and this is useful because this helps you address the ecotops later. So what other related insects will, will it kill? Um, what does it do? What do I know from the literature about what this organism is? I think it's really good also to know things like the um, temperature growth profile. What's the temperature range over which this will work? And one of the reasons that is useful is so for example, quite a lot of the species that come from sort of more northern countries or higher altitudes, they won't grow above about 30, 30 degrees, which means that they can't be pathogenic to humans either. So that gives you quite a good argument. And so you'll see applicants put this argument forward as to why it might not need to do some human safety testing, because if it doesn't grow, it can't be pathogenic. And the same for birds. Birds have a high body temperature. If your strain doesn't grow at high temperature, they can't be pathogenic to birds. So knowing some good basic facts about your microorganism is good practice, but it also could be useful and it helps evaluators and you as evaluators to understand where the risks would sit for this microorganism. And then there should be information about the target organism that you're intending to use it for. Um, and then there should be information about the potential of microorganisms to produce secondary compounds. But again, the focus there is on ones that are concerned for human health. It's not finding out all the microorganisms that could be produced, uh, sorry, secondary compounds that could be produced. It's finding the secondary compounds that are toxicologically relevant and that could be a problem. Um, physiological properties, useful to know, and genetic stability. Now, this is one that asked for, it's, do you know, none of us have got probably enough time in our lives to really answer this one. So the way in which this one's usually answered is by the applicant providing information 
on the good quality of how they maintain their strain. So what a lot of companies do will they'll passage the strain back through the host organism or they hold large stocks in a freezer and then they take as at the beginning of each year, they take a new stock and start a production run. And in this way, they manage the genetic stability. And so you'll often see the information put forward to address this point is about how things are maintained in the laboratory. And then the other part is that um, checking whether or not microorganisms will produce antimicrobials that in interfere with human and veterinary medicine. And there are some sort of quite simple methods that can be followed um, to, to address this. And the idea being is that if um, somebody was, who's immune compromised um, got you know, inf an infection of, the, of this microorganism, are there available antimicrobials that, the, um, that could be used to, to, um, by hospitals to help them? Um, so this part needs to be addressed. So Alison, th that was quite a large part. And I can't emphasize enough how this is the really critical part of the dossier for a microorganism is the biological properties. So Alison, have any specific questions come in on that? No, we did have a comment um, and, and I guess I have a question as well. I mean, some of this stuff might be quite general, I would think, or, or not to like say a bovaria, not, not down, I know there's different strains of, of these, but, but would some of these things, you'd have a lot of this information would be available anyway, around the life cycle, natural occurrence. Exactly. This is a lot of this is based on doing some good research of the literature and okay. doing a really good strategic literature review to find the information. And then what you'll maybe have is one or two pieces of specific things which sort of says confirms that your strain does the same as the literature yep. is telling you. Okay. And and I guess I, I did ask here for any regulators in the audience um, who have uh, been involved with dossiers, what aspects often need more information or data? So we, we got a reply here from Malaysia saying the concerns much more around the efficacy part and product specifications. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll we'll maybe pick up on that in some of the later sessions then again on efficacy. I'll maybe I wasn't going to touch more on efficacy, but reflecting on that, maybe I can add something in more. Okay, great. Thanks, Roma. Okay, so biological properties. And um, something I wanted to sort of just reflect on, and I've said this, but just I think it's important, so I want to say again, is we don't live in a world without microorganisms. Um, and sometimes I see some evaluations or considerations made and it's as though there's no other microorganisms out there. There are microorganisms everywhere. They're all over the plants, they're all over the soil. And what these biocontrol agents are doing is you're putting a lot of microorganisms in at one point of time to have the effect at that point in time. But sitting in the background, we have bio biocontrols always operating, it's always working. We're kind of just doing a top up or, or that's what's got, what the applicants are doing. Um, and so they just they know when the pests will occur. So they just want to top up on the system when the pest occurs. Um, but as an evaluator, it, it's, it's remembering that the environment that these um, substances are used in is not microbial free, um, but that it's human pathogens that cause a problem for humans. It's not. And we know that these things aren't human pathogens. We have to prove they're not human pathogens, therefore, once you've confirmed that you're a human pathogen, actually what we're trying to do, we have less concerns about. Um, so just emphasizing that, so just thinking about microorganisms. So one, yep, plant colonizing microorganisms are really common. Secondary compounds will be produced. It's what microorganisms do, but it's only if they're toxicologically relevant do we need to be concerned about them. Um, we know that plant colonizing microorganisms will affect affect plant physiology. So when we see efficacy data, we might be seeing comments about the improved quality of the fruit or improvement in yield. When we're looking at, we're used to in chemistry thinking about persistence, well, there isn't really persistence of microorganism, but you do have survivability. So one of the things you're thinking about is, will this survive in the environment long enough to cause harm or cause a perturbation? And that's what we'll deal with in, um, when we're talking about the environmental fate. Um, and sorry, something pinged into my mind then about survivability. 
yeah. <coughs> And the other thing is a lot of these microorganisms have the possibility to grow. And actually that's sort of what you want them to do. So when you put a trichoderma on, what you want it to do is colonize the roots. So it will grow, but it only grows for a short while. And then it's challenged by all the other microorganisms in the environment and it, 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 will, it will diminish. So that's what I mean by survivability. They will grow and persist for a period, but then they diminish. But that's what we expect them to do. And that's what um, we're accounting for in, in, the, in, the, in an application. Um, multiple interactions going on. So on the one hand, the amount of information you need to provide for a microorganism may be less, but it's really quite complex and it's, it's a different type of substance and it's a very different kind of assessment. Um, and when we think about mode of action, it's probably really hard to pin down all of the modes of action, but there's only some, some of the modes of actions we can understand. So. Trichoderma, again, they can stimulate plant defense mechanisms. You can have direct antagonism against the, the pathogen. You can have microorganisms which are hyperparasitic on the fungi. They can have all these attributes, but the actual molecular mechanism, we may never know. Um, and nor do we need to know to make a good quality risk assessment. Someone asked earlier about storage stability. Um, so when in a dossier, Traditionally, you would do an accelerated high temperature storage stability study. I can tell you now that's not going to work for microorganisms. All you're going to do is kill them. Um, and most of the guidelines now recognize that. So the accelerated high temperature storage stability study is not asked for. But what is asked for is a long term real time storage stability study, usually run over two years. Um, and at, at uh, either room temperature or at cold temperature, the applicant will choose which one is best for their strain. Um, but you do need that, but there's, no, there's virtually no point doing accelerated high temperature study, even with the provisions to have this at a slightly lower temperature, like 34 degrees for 12 weeks, you're gonna kill most of the microorganisms anyway. So there's just no point doing that. And then the long-term storage stability study is done with the product, not with the active substance. Just Roma, just quickly, just quickly for the um, long term, I mean, for the storage stability or long term study, you said mm -hmm. two years, um, mm -hmm. is that would they'd have to do it on their product? So they would yeah. have had to have done that before and, and you can't, you have, it has to be that particular strain and that, that particular product. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in the right formulation, in the formulation that you want to sell, you do long term storage stability study of your active substance in the formulation that you intend to sell. Now, quite often, People haven't got to the end of the two-year storage stability study when they yep. submit their dossier. That was my next question. <laughs> so, what, so what happens then is you do use by date on, and that use by date will be used within six months if the study's run for six months. If it then runs for oh, a year, okay. it's used by a year, and so on. And can and that be updated? Some, yeah. Most, okay. most, most, you just, the, the applicant will go back into the regulator and say, look, here's my updated data. And okay. then they, they're given a label provision to change the use by date to, to a okay. year. Great, and, thank you. That's pretty much what happens just for pragmatic reasons. So it doesn't yep. slow down the approval. Yep, that's what I was thinking. So thanks. Okay. So um, one of the things I wanted to just talk about for microorganisms, because um, I suspect many of you who are sitting in evaluation offices are very, very busy. And the idea of having all these microorganism dossiers coming in is probably a little bit daunting. But something that um, the F WHO FAO really sat and thought about and saying, well, there's, there's information that is nice to know, and there's information that we really need to know to make a safety assessment. And what they worked out was that for certain microorganisms, it is possible to make a risk assessment based on a minimum amount of information. And what they said that minimum amount of information was full and unequivocal taxonomic identification. So you really know what it is and you're certain about that. Confirmation that the production process can confirm that there would be no secondary compounds present. Confirmation that the, the formulation is with inert substances. Confirmation that there's something living still in there. So that the, the, the CFU viability potency is, is good. So that's your five batch analysis. Um, Confirmation of the physical technical properties of your um, formulation. Absolutely confirming there's no human pathogens pre present and then having sufficient efficacy for label claim. But for that efficacy, one of the things that you can do is 
it's quite reasonable to take the data from somewhere which has a similar climate. And EPO, the European Plant Protection Organization, has some guidance documents on when it's reasonable to have extrapolation and when it's not reasonable to have extrapolation. So if a dossier comes across your desk and you haven't got time to assess everything, you could run through and just check these points and actually be fairly co be confident to make an assessment based on these points. Now, of course, if you can't confirm these points, then you're going to have to look further in the dossier. But it is quite reasonable to make a risk assessment based on these points. I just wonder if there's any comments on that, because that's quite a daring thing to propose. No, but I have asked it. I've actually asked our experts. We've got quite a few from Malaysia online, and I'm sure we've got some others from other countries hidden in the room. So if you feel like uh, giving your opinion on that, I, I've asked if um, Malaysia if they've had any experience or, uh, um, or any comments on the sort of critical data requirements list or guidance. I guess that you've just put up here, Roma. Um, I think that's it's it's always interesting as and helpful. I think when you're a regulator, just to have at least these critical things that you definitely have to tick off. It gives mm. you a sort of a starting point, some runs on the board as we would say in New Zealand. Um, there is a comment here around, just from Fariti about generally, and, and I think this is important, it's not quite associated with this, but it's just saying that the symptoms to occur on the target pest is relatively slow. So it doesn't mean it's not effective. It's just that farmers have that lag time before they see the impact of the biopesticide or, or what has been used. It, we talked about that last week in our um, BT webinar yeah. as well so I think that's a good comment so thanks for making it I think that's really important as well and we picked up on that in the um the sessions on um efficacy for yep. biopesticides yeah so yep. if, if you listen to those there's some comments there and then maybe when you come to the next session if there's you've still got unanswered questions um that we raise them again yep yep no that's true um, so anyone, if you've got some thoughts, I guess definitely if you're a regulator, if this is helpful, this sort of list, and if you knew it was there, or if you if you have a similar sort of list that that you might use for an initial glance, I guess as well. Sometimes it's helpful to when you have an initial look at a dossier or, or something, you sort of look for these main things first. When you see these missing, you know that it's definitely not complete. I guess that's that's the approach, Roma. Yeah, but it's also to say that um, it, there may, there's maybe a possibility of having much um, lighter approach to regulation. Yeah. Um, because a lot of what we've, the regulation that we're working with for microbials is inherited from what's been developed over the last 50 years for chemicals. Yeah. And the question is, this thing, are we always asking the right questions? Do we need to know all of this information? Because we're dealing with substances which are um, found in nature. Um, and that doesn't mean that they don't cause harm. Absolutely doesn't mean it doesn't cause harm. And that's what you're checking for is saying, okay, we know that basically that's where it's found. Is it a human pathogen? Is it going to do what the applicant's saying it's going to do? Have they been foolish enough to leave human pathogens in there? Have they got sort of toxic secondary compounds in there? Yeah. Those are these are the red flag points. So then if I'm not seeing those red flags, we're probably um, going to be okay to get this approved. Okay, yep, no, good point. And let's um, see if we get some discussion on that further through the session. We might follow up with people as well in an anonymous poll at some stage, just to sort of see what your thoughts are around that, whether you can have this lighter approach, I guess, uh, as Rome is pointing out. And I think maybe to what I should put, how I should put it was sort of when we were writing the guidance for WHO, I sort of had in my mind two things is one, I didn't want it to make it difficult for people who are doing good quality work and were presenting good quality information and were being good about what they did in the sense of getting rid of human pathogens. But I also wanted it to be strong enough to catch people who hadn't been good about making sure there's no human pathogens, yeah. who hadn't been good about checking there's no toxins in there, who hadn't perhaps been co-formulating with something that shouldn't be in there. Yeah. So we sort of held both of those in balance as we tried to make a sort of pragmatic approach to regulation. Excellent. And I see that um, we have from FAO here, I think. Uh, please find a link to the EPPO extrapolation tables Roma mentioned in her presentation. Thanks so much for um, sharing that. Yeah, thank anyway. you. Yeah. Okay. okay. So really, I was going to sort of 
stop there with, with microorganisms and talk a little bit about botanicals and senior chemicals um, and firstly about botanicals. And the reason I wanted to do this is that there's a tendency to think of botanicals as chemicals. And yes, they are to some extent, but they have attributes that make them a little bit different. And then the same for senior chemicals. So what am I talking about when I talk about botanicals? Well, we have to provide similar information as you'd see for, for a chemical, uh, conventional chemical pesticide. Um, so when we're talking about botanicals, we're talking about um, substances that are extracted in some way from plants. Now, what we know is that plants, to defend themselves against herbivores, they produce secondary plant compounds. They're all in plants. Sometimes we can smell this as lovely aromatic compounds. Um, sometimes they might not smell pleasant, but there's no doubt plants produce some things which are also exceedingly toxic. Um, and again, like the microbes, what we want to so say, how do you register in a way that is there's, there's groups of substances for which we don't have toxicological concerns and there's groups of substances where we do have toxicological concerns. So it's not a case of one size fits all, but it's about thinking about it in terms of sort of saying, well, how do we regulate the ones where we, and be certain where we have less concerns and how do we regulate and what do we need to do for the ones where we do think there's more concern? So this is the concept between, between sort of botanical guidance and thinking about things as a botanical active substance. Now, a botanical, in the same way as a microorganism, it can be produced in, in lots of different ways. It can be just simply crushed. Um, so like olive oil is a botanical um, and it's just obtained by crushing. Others are milled, others go through really sophisticated processes of distillation and extraction and obtaining a specific compound. Some come out as mixtures of compounds, some come out as a very simple one. And what we can increasingly see is um, researchers using microorganisms to produce some, so what, what are botanicals? So we have all of these kind of things to consider when we're talking about a botanical. Um, so the, again, thinking about the guidance, what we wanted to do. So we want, we know that it's a very heterogeneous group of substances and that some are very refined or some are very, very complex. And so there's, there's a group, I mentioned olive oil. So we know when you crush olive oil, uh, cross olives to get oil or you or palm or something like that you know that there is still palm oil you know that it's still soy oil but you know somebody one farmer will say well my soil is different from my soil oil, but it's still all soy oil so you've got that group of some substances um, but then you also have something like um, there's a company who's extracted um, the oils from the peel of citrus, which is a waste product from um, the orange, ju orange juice industry. And the substance they've extracted is limonene. And their botanical is about 98% or 95% pure. So you, you have both of those um, extremes when you think about botanicals. But what is sure is you're pretty much going to have a mixture. It's rare to have a purity of, of 95%. You're going to have a really big mixture in there. So the critical regulatory aspects are, you need to think about the quality of the source material, the plant material, and that it's correctly identified and it shouldn't be a mixture of species. It's just one species used to produce this material. What you have to think about is how it's cultivated, how it's harvested, how it's stored, and then how it's processed. And then the reason why cultivation is important because you need to think about the land on which the plants are grown. So is that land pure? free of heavy metals. Did they use pesticides when they were producing it? Because if those are possibilities, then they need to check that they have none of those residues and impurities remaining in the active substance. But what ha often happens is there's wild harvesting or people are using organic production where they're not having those inputs. But you need to think about that. And then about how it's harvested and stored. So if some plant material is left to say wilt or rot in the field, it could potentially pick up a, a microorganism contaminant in there, which could produce um, metabolites, for example, or in that degradation process, the, the substances could have changed in some way. Um, so you need to know about that and they, the applicant needs to provide good information about that. And then there needs to be manufacturing. So, okay, you've got that burn the plant material, you've harvested it all, what then happens? So some manufacturers will just steep it in hot water, some manufacturers will crush it, some of them will um, 
put it through, uh, will mill it and put it through various other pro processes. And the applicant needs to explain very well what they do. That's obviously confidential information sits in the confidential part of the dossier, but they need to explain that really well. And from that, you get a definition um, of your active substance. Um, and the question we need to think about is, do we need to think about residues and efficacy, as I mentioned, is something that we um, weren't going to directly address here today. So thinking about identity um, and what that means for a botanical. So you need the identity of the plant source material, um, but you shouldn't have a mixture of species. So that needs to be identified well. Um, you need to detail the agronomy, the production, the harvest, and you need to detail whether the manufacturing process. And the result of all those steps will give you your specification of your active substance. Um, so how do you work out what you've got if you've got a really big mixture? So um, the technical braid should be defined by a suitable method, and that could be HPLC, spectrophotometry, MXR. There's a whole range of different techniques that could be used by an applicant. But what you need to be look, thinking about is, is, is the method they use the right method for that active substance? And that profile that they then get, get Derive is called the chemical fin fingerprint of the technical grade. And that's what you do produce five batches of. And what you're looking for is each of the batches they produce will be the same. Now, because a plant grown in one year could be different from a plant grown in another year, then there, there may be sort of quite wide ranges on those specifications. And that's a negotiation with the applicant as how wide that range is and what the implications are of having that wide range of specification. Um, and as I mentioned, when you talk about impurities, they, you know, if they can't confirm that they grew it on good quality land, and I would say to applicants, you should take soil samples and check that you're growing on good quality land. Um, they need to just check the compositions, their active substance doesn't contain heavy metals or mycotoxins or other, other things like that. But based on the taxonomy and based on how the botanicals are produced, from a risk assessment point of view, we can think of three groups as a basic principle. Now, these are not hard and fast groups and something may be in one group for one aspect and another group for another aspect. But the basic idea is what I described at the beginning is that you have something that is really quite simple and it may be, like I said, a soy oil. And soil from one region may be slightly different from soil from another region, but they're still soils. And what the applicant should do is they, they decide what type of quality soil they're using and they run an analysis of that and they get a fingerprint of it. Now, you may have a group where you have that mixture in there, but perhaps when you run your human safety test, you notice you had some toxicity or something. Then what you should do is go back and identify which of the peaks caused that. And what is that in there? And just think, what is that substance? And can they get rid of it? And as an applicant, I would advise you to think about, can you get rid of it? And as a regulator saying, well, if you haven't got rid of it, what does this mean for the risk assessment? How do I consider this? And then there's a third group for which maybe a plant that nobody knows anything about, you don't know what kind of compounds it produces, and then you're gonna to have to do a lot more work, but you run that profile and you have to name what all the peaks are and you need to check your toxicity. So you're, those are substances where you've got a lot more work to do as an applicant um, and as an evaluator, the dossier will be much bigger. So this is an example of um, uh, identity and composition of something. So this is from um, Black Cardamom. Someone is it's from a research paper and they just took five samples of Black Cardamom and looked at what the peaks look like and this is what they got so they've got three peaks they've got limonene um, alpha terpenene and terpenol um, and so that that five of those is equivalent to your five batch analysis and that's what you'll be looking for in your dossier is to have some really nice um, clear results like that now unfortunately it is you can well if you can see the differences between samples one two three four and five is the amount of each component varies and that's fine we expect that to do that in plants, what you have then is a you're looking for the applicant to say what's the range that they expect to stay in. And most applicants will take one of those peaks and say, I quality control to stay within this range for this peak. Um, and then they produce a five batch analysis based on that. Does that make sense? 
It does. It's really good. And actually, um, just uh, just on that, it's interesting. I see Cyril. Cyril, I hope I've got this right because I think you're doing your master's. Um, uh, it could be doctorate, but I, I have a feeling it might be his master's. But he was trying different botanicals. I know he's looking at botanicals, investigating them, and was interested around full army wound control. So he's just got a comment in here that he did try tubely. Uh, um, a rote known based botan botanical, um, but he stopped it because they're toxic to aquatic life. Um, a rote known is banned globally. There we so go. So it's good, good that you stopped it. <laughs> yeah. Give it. Given it's given it's from a plant, is what go, go back to the beginning and saying plants can produce toxic compounds. Exactly. It doesn't mean because it came from a plant that it's it's not going to cause harm. So that's about why we have to understand what's in there. Um, and we need to know very well what's in there and we shouldn't be working with um, banned substances or toxic substances so well done on stopping that part Jeff. so that's a good example and Cyril I, I don't because I know that you're doing I think you may be looking at neem too I'm not sure but if you could share because your work's really great so it's fantastic that you're here um, and he's been following the series um, so if you can share what other botanicals you may be working on if you are that would be great so thanks for sharing that with us and I guess that that list of banned sort of uh substances is that where do you find that Roma just as a um yeah so so people like um the FAO keep a list of, of highly hazardous pesticides yeah yep great yeah. so um yeah it's it, it's it, as you said you, you know you you sometimes you don't know what's in there and you go to test it and you hit toxicity and think oh okay what happens now I've got something I didn't expect to have um, and that's why I said at the beginning is it's not for microorganisms and botanicals, it's not that they're not toxic, it's that people are choosing not to bring those to the marketplace because yep. they feel that that's not what farming wants today and it doesn't fit within IPM practices. Okay, great. Thanks, Rana. So um, store stability, most botanicals will store really quite well and so it's quite feasible to do an accelerated store stability study but not all of them. Um, and one of the things that features in many of the botanicals is a lot of them are monoterpenes, which are highly volatile. And experience tells me um, when you start to try and run tests with this, what you find out is you find out all the holes in your pipe work in your system for running any tests because the volatiles just disappear and they escape. And they go through. I was working with one GLP lab who is doing an aquatic study and it took them three months to plug all the holes in their um, pipe work and their tank system so they could do the aquatic study and then it worked out the result we got was it's so highly volatile it volatilizes in 15 minutes and it doesn't kill the fishes but it took a long time to get to that point so if you're working with these botanicals um just that's one of the things i'd say to you is, is it's it's really likely that things escape and i'd say as an evaluator that's one of the things you want to look for like was this study done really well did the test material actually get to where the test was done or had it all volatilized and escaped off um, but also it's part of that argument understanding this these physical properties about it is saying well if it volatilizes in 15 minutes i'm not really going to have an aquatic tox problem i'm not necessarily going to have an environmental problem because it's just volatilized and broken down so quickly so again it's it's that understanding of what substance is what its biology is what it's attributes are helping us to to make a risk assessment both as applicators and as evaluators then how we can um say well what what's the information the applicants told us that helps us to um work out where the risks really sit for this substance that has been brought to us but again you, you would have the real-time long-term storage stability studies with a formulated product for this and again if you haven't done the one year or two years, depending on the country requirements, you would need to use a use by date as a pragmatic alternative. So that's what I was going to say on, on botanicals. So if there's no uh, questions particularly come up with, then I'll move on to talk about the senior chemicals. There's just um, there's one question around what could be the residual uh, period in monocots. Uh, resi resi residual. Residual. So a residual efficacy or residual I'm not quite sure it's MRLs. well let's go for the second I one maybe it, it says residual you can ask it about both it does say residual but yeah okay so um in terms of um how long a, a botanical will remain active that entirely depends on the type of substance if they're highly volatile 
they are going to have volatilize. Um, but the other thing to think about is these are substances that plants produce all the time. So what you, as you might expect, the environment of plants are covered in microorganisms and microorganisms are one of the main driving factors for breaking down botanicals. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so when you're putting a, the, these substances out there, there's often quite rapid effects of biotic and abiotic effects which break down these substances. How long that takes will depend on the type of substance and depends on the type of environment they're going into. So yep. that's something I would think um, I would expect an applicant to have thought about and to provide information on that sort of mode of action and some of that biology as to what they, they think is going on. In terms of residues, now this is an interesting one. How do you look for a residue of something that was already in the plant anyway? Um, so you'll see in the FAO guidance document a really thoughtful consideration of do you, there's a lot of botanicals for which you won't have a residue. Um, because something like limonene, limonene is found in lots of plants, like tomatoes, full of limonene. So what you're looking at then is, is the amount of substance you put out going to be significantly greater than would already have yep. existing exposure to humans, the environment, or ecotops. Um, and you're again providing information and balance that. And if it is initially, how quickly does it degrade? Um, and when the, when um, how long would you have a problem for and is that acceptable or unacceptable okay the time. okay and the last question here is why why are there some biocontrol products that are not included in the who classification and i'm not okay. quite sure what that means because mm. i don't know if there's a who classification for biocontrol products so chan mm. if you could have another go at maybe just being a just giving us a little bit more clarification around that question that would be good and then we can answer it um great thank you i want to just move on so that we finish and have time for questions so, yep. so senior chemicals so when you think about a senior chemical um we're inclined to think okay senior chemicals are chemistry why might we think that they're not the same as chemistry why do they get thought of as bioprotectors or something different well what we think about the senior chemicals similar chemicals are not used to kill anything Senior chemicals are used to influence the behavior of something. So what they do is, so the best known ones are the mating destruction ones. So you create um, a volatile plume in the air and this volatile plume in the air of usually the sort of female pheromone means that the males can't find the individual females and they can't mate and you can't get the next generation, but you don't actually kill anything. And the other part about semi chemicals is the quantities that you use are very, very small. And the, so the amount that, that's going out there and the thing about semi chemicals is the insects, usually because it's insects, res don't only respond to a certain quantity. Once you hit that quantity, you don't need any more out there. You only need that amount. And the amount that causes that is the same as a, they'd be producing naturally anyway. So when you think about exposure, the amount that is being produced is the same as being produced. Again, what you're trying to do is you're trying to produce or to put that semi chemical out at the right time for the life cycle in the right quantity, but you're not significantly adding to what may not go on anyway in the, in the right circumstances. Um, so this is why senior chemicals get pulled into th being thought about as microbials, botanicals, senior chemicals, because they don't kill. And because the amounts that are being used are similar to the amounts that would be out in nature. It's just you're using them at the right time for your, pe for your pest and your crop. So these are substances emitted by plants, animals, other organisms that change the behavior of something. You can see them, they're put out as um, on traps. So they're often, um, Semi chemicals are really good at being absorbed into things like PVC. So you'll often see them um, absorbed into a plastic and then slow released. Also, there are some sprayable ones that are coming along as well, which have got slow release encapsulation technology. And they'll be used for mating disruption, as I just described. Sometimes you'll use lure and kill where you're attracting things into a space and they pick up a dose of something else. Um, or sometimes you bring lots of them in and you trap them in water, for example, and you kill them. 
Um, in mouse trapping, you'd probably be using something, a chiromone, and a chiromone is something that um, mimics the smells that food would give them. Um, so there's different ways in which they're using, but always in very small quantity. Um, to, so to support a simplified approach, um, many SEMA chemicals, as I mentioned, they have a non-toxic target specific mode of action. So they're not, um, they're changing behavior. They're not killing it. They're naturally found often comparable at background levels. They're generally effective at very low rates. They'll dissipate really quickly. They're so highly volatile, they disappear um, because of how they're used and the quantities. So one, humans don't generally respond to insect pheromones. Um, so they propose a limited or no risk to human health and the environment. They generally, there's no residues associated with them. And one of the things that I wasn't in touch about, efficacy is really difficult because you have to work at it for trials at a landscape scale. So that's really hard to do. And this is why WHO FA wanted to include them in the guidance, including something simple. Um, so, so just thinking about the, the, the senior chemicals then. So the dossier you would broadly follow is the same as for a chemical dossier, but um, the information that you're asking for um, needs to take into consideration of how these senior chemicals are going to be used. And there's a lot of information you're not going to need to see. So when um, an applicant puts in a dossier as an evaluator, you may be looking at it and thinking, well, there's not lots of data. I don't, there shouldn't be gaps that the applicant should have always explained why they're not providing data, but it would be quite common to see that you've got a reasoned case rather than a study being presented in that, that sort of chemical style dossier that's being produced. So that's as far as I was going with semi chemicals. So were there any questions that's come up with botanicals or semi chemicals now? Uh, yes, we, ha we have some comments coming in here. Um, uh, and, and thanks, it's ex extremely interesting as well. And it's really nice to see the, you know, the difference here between the botanicals and then um, before, before then. Um, uh, here's a question here from Utaza. What is your advice or opinion to use mixtures of microorganisms plus botanicals or microorganisms plus chemical pesticides or botanicals and chemical pesticides? Do you think that they can coexist? Um, are there some WHO guidelines or are there guidelines or information on this sort of approach of mixing? Yeah, so in terms of the dossier coming through, I don't think it makes sense to have a dossier which has got a mixture in there. You need to understand the attributes of each of the components that you might have in a product. If somebody wants to mix them in a product, um, then I would expect them to sort of say, have specific information, so you'd have the information about the botanical active substance, you'd have information about the microbial active substance, you'd have information about all of those, and then you'd have all the information about them combined in a product. I've got to say, I think that's going to be really hard to do. So as somebody who's involved helping companies develop products, I think it would be very complex to make that. I think the chance of having compatibility between all the different components is really low because um, it's very every chance your botanical will kill your microbial um, so it's not if I was advising a company I wouldn't be advising a company to do that because I think it makes your dossier much more complex consequently much more expensive and for an evaluator it makes it a really difficult risk assessment I think you'd be if you had a really just and the cost of goods is going to go massively high so I think I would say to somebody saying, if you want to do a mixture, why wouldn't you do a mixture by doing a rotation in an IPM program or doing a tank mix or something like that? I think from a registration point of view, it would be costly and complicated. And there's a lot of studies that are going to just be about impossible to do. I really yeah. wouldn't recommend doing it. <laughs> so. And just just a quick question. I mean, I guess in your experience of you know working with lots of different companies and working with, within the IBMA, for example, um, is, is there any out of these three different sort of groups here? Is there anything that is like the most popular one at the moment, or is a is a leading popular sort of approach? Is it botanicals at the moment, or is all the trend towards semiochemicals? Because we hear, we we hear lots of exciting semiochemicals sort of. 
yeah. uh, examples last year. But is it, is it sort of a trend or is there sort so of a popularity look contest? Com- yeah. <laughs> so look at what's coming down. So, you know, if you're sitting as a regulator and you're sort of saying, OK, what kind of dossiers am I going to get coming through my door? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it used to be microorganisms. And we could see from the figures I gave at the beginning that there was a lot of interest in microorganisms. And like you said, you know, one time there was one trichoderma and now there's 15 or there was one bacillus suff- and my liquefacins and there's five. So we see lots of more of the same coming through. So it's another strain of the same species. Um, and that will continue. But what I can really see people are very excited about are botanicals and senior chemicals. Okay. And I can see, so the, the semia chemicals, because this idea that you can manage the behavior of your pest, but yeah. also that you can, um, you can do things like you manage the behavior of the pest. So one thing, I, one semia chemical I like, it makes the insects fly. And then if you make the insects fly, then you can go through with your spray. And so insects that might be hidden under the leaves mm-hmm. are suddenly in the air. And when you put, come through with a spray, you can target the spray and it, the spray could be a microorganism and they all just sort of catch a dose. So there's some really smart things coming like that. And there's some other ones where some senior chemicals in like wheat. So wheat produces a senior chemical, which attracts the natural enemies to come and eat the aphids. Oh, yeah, that's cool. And so, yeah. So, so someone's registering that as a product and it goes into wheat and it's not killing anything. It's just making the lacewings come and eat the aphids off the plant. So you're seeing things like that. So that's really some really nice things coming senior chemicals. But botanicals are really there's some really exciting things coming in. I think the challenge with botanicals is, is, you know, if I see a botanical and it's got brilliant efficacy, I'm thinking, oh, is there toxicity in there? So I'd always say, if you've got a botanical and you've got brilliant ex- efficacy, go and get your tops testing done just to make sure that you haven't got something that's really toxic. But there's a lot of botanicals coming forward. Um, the complexity for an evaluator, if you're used to dealing with single molecule ke- chemistry, having a dossier that comes across your table, which is from a botanical, really makes you scratch your head a little bit about how to handle it oh that's, so that's good okay well let's keep that let's keep that in mind then because <laughs> hopefully we'll, we'll have a trend and, and that might be something to look out for for our regulators on on the call today um yeah. we've got about 10 minutes left so i'm going to let you go for it up. yep yep i'm just going to buy it so so um, we talked about fast track, track evaluation, and I said for the microbials of some of the things you can do is look at your main red flags, or, or maybe that's all you need to, to, to look for to evaluate, because, you know, do you need to read everything in the dossier, or can you just read some things that are critical? And I think the answer is you can just read some things that are critical. We don't, there's a lot of information that's sometimes provided that doesn't help us make a risk assessment. But what really makes, um, uh, help, helps for bioprotection regulatory capacity is really having a dedicated scheme developing a, re- a guideline a regulation that are for, tailored for these bioprotectants that really helps i showed at the beginning the countries where it goes fastest is in countries which have done this having expert evaluators like those of you who've attended today you really clearly interested in becoming those expert evaluators who really understand these technologies and that's really good and positive I think it's very good to have a clear process so everybody, the applicant and the evaluator knows all the steps. And it should be really thinking about what data do we need to know to help us make a good risk assessment, not all the information that could possibly be be provided. Because sometimes an applicant can swamp you in information and large parts of that you think, well, that doesn't help me make a risk assessment, it's just information. So both sides need to provide good quality, appropriate information. Um, and I think it's really important to have dialogue between the applicants and evaluators and between evaluators between different countries um, to have trusted, engaged partnerships. You know, there, there can be a, there's a lot of capacity or potential to have work sharing and reciprocal um, data arrangements. Um, and so one person making an assessment for another one. So, you know, if you get a dossier from a from another country, Do you need to redo the assessment or is there just certain parts that you need to check for your country? Harmonisation. I mean, just cut down on the workload because there's a lot of stuff coming and harmonise and work with with colleagues um, in other countries and within your own departments to make this go as smoothly as possible. Sharing of data um, as much as possible that an assessment made by one country can be trusted and accepted by another country. Um, and I think also you need this government support to create this environment to allow all of this to, ha- to happen, to ha- help 
these new inventions that are coming forward to help them come through and to help the evaluators so that you have capacity to do these things because there's this learning process as well you've got to sort of kind of train your applicants sometimes so it's quite a difficult process where everybody needs to be trained but if you can follow some of these practices it does help um, and does make things go faster I think just to finish up sort of a little bit of thinking is what's coming next you, you mentioned this Alison is biological based crop protection it requires all of these disciplines and this is what makes it kind of complicated and uh, yes also some chemistry of course some chemistry um, I've left a slide here which has got some resources but as Alison said we will provide um, a resource pack for you all um, and with, with links to this information and other information I've mentioned today. Um, and then I'd just like to finish and sort of say, well, this is part one and there's a part two coming. So thank you. I'll stop sharing and then we can perhaps take some Q&A. Excellent. Just before you stop sharing, oh. um, I'll just, uh, so I'm just going to point everyone to next week on Tuesday. I'm going to open up for questions though, because we've still got five minutes, but next Tuesday, you should already have a link. Um, if you sign up for one, I think you have the registration for everything and you're getting lots of, you're getting some applause there already, well, Roma. I've never but, seen those before. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will be emailing everyone as well. So don't worry, um, you will receive all those resources, etc., cetera, in a follow-up email. And I'm really keen to hear for example, from Malaysia, but from others in the room as well around your experiences more with your regulatory system, what could be, um, what works well too um, from your experience um, and your in-depth experience of dealing with these dossiers, dealing with these, um, you know, applicants. I'd really like to hear um, what doesn't work so well, what needs more support. And I'm really keen to hear from applicants where you need more support. And Roma, so I'm going to follow up some questions. And, and I asked everyone in the room here uh, a question around if you could have more support on, reg uh, on regulations or by a control regulation as an applicant or a regulator what would you wish for so if I was the person with a magic wand <laughs> I'm really keen and, and if you're too shy to, to answer now um, don't worry you can always email me but as we sort of try and work out what can we develop going forward to best support this region um, to mm -hmm. best support you it's really good to hear what things you find um, difficult um, we've got one answer here, uh, critical endpoints, easier dossier or easy dossier that you can help the evaluator and the applicant. So, so that end your thoughts? Is a really interesting, yeah, that endpoint's a really interesting one because that endpoint sort of approach is derived from chemistry. Most, for many, not all, and I'll never say all, many microorganism dossiers, you don't have endpoints. The, the, you get to the point of saying, I had no adverse effects in my studies, therefore I don't have an endpoint. So there isn't something to plug into a model. There isn't a model that you need to do. So that's what makes them simpler, is that it's, it's a different approach. It, it's, so my, my wish would be sort of saying, well, it's not about chemistry. So I think if we, had to, if we started today and started again, I would say we should be dr driven by the mode of action and understanding the, what we have in the, our hands, the packet, and what the mode of action is and saying, okay, with these two things, where do I think the risks will sit and work through? And that's sort of that decision tree approach, that sort of working out where the risks, and then you really just look at the information where, where the risks really sit and you're not having, as an evaluator, having to plow through piles of really yeah. not interesting information that isn't helping you make a risk assessment. Yeah, good so point. Think, yeah, I think, it, so my wish would be to adopt a, biopesticide specific regulation and I think the FAO framework is a really good starting point to do okay. that and to make that easy. Okay great now, another I mean I really like that the last I liked all the slides but there was a really good slide at the end as well you talked about the dialogue um, important to have dialogue between the I guess the regulator and the applicant I guess is there a concern sometimes that you sort of think that you're talking to the person that's just trying to get something through to sell and and that maybe I'm not being objective uh, if or I could yeah, open myself could, up how do you build trust in that in that yeah, aspect yeah you could do that and I, I, and I think I've heard people saying that but I also think the evaluators are experienced and good people who know what they're doing and I think sort of so we, we tr should trust those people to do a good job and yes there are applicants out there who are perhaps trying to do something that is not good practice um, but those are rare they're really rare and I think if you're a good evaluator you can spot those rare you can spot those ones yeah. really well so I think 
if you have good dialogue between both partners right from the beginning, um, then I think that you build that trust relationship. And I think that trust relationship is not just between the evaluators and the regulators, but it's between regulators within departments. So you trust yeah, your point. Tops people, you trust your environmental fate people, but yep. you also trust the same in the next door country um, okay. as well. And I think that comes from dialogue. That comes from good dialogue. Okay, now we're not going to get away from efficacy because it is uh, always the topic of interest. I'm add it in at the end of it. Yeah, and, it and I will here. just remind everyone there is two really good efficacy um, workshops we did last year, which are brilliant, that uh, Roma also led. Um, lots of good examples too and really getting down into the nitty gritty of what it means. But I, I think we've got a good question here from Karen. Can we trial the BCA in field conditions if the efficacy is equal to or below 50%? Yeah, you can always do that. Um, what's important is um, how you design the trial to do that. And it's important that the label reflects that's the level of efficacy, okay. because sometimes 50% is enough. If you're, if it's say a product that doesn't kill all your natural enemies um, in a um, protected cropping situation or with a very sort of gentle crop, um, you want something that just knocks the population back, that just slows the population down and 50% would be enough to do that but it, it's important that the label explains that so that the yeah. user understands that that's what they're using okay and one more question here last question maybe and, and we have this quite a bit too um <coughs> is are there is there resistance or are there resistance build up issues with biopesticides similar to chemical uh pesticides good question yeah so yeah um, and I think Daniel touched on this for, for the BTs, and so the, he, he did a nice piece talking about that um, um, early in the week. Oh, no, it was last week, wasn't it? Um, so I, as a scientist, I would, I would never say never, but I would say the probability is very low for most of the mi microorganisms and botanicals. And the reason I say that is because they have complex and multiple modes of action and they have multiple sites of action. And that always makes it harder for resistance to build up. Um, and I think as, as scientists and as developers now, we know about resistance, which we didn't perhaps in the past. And it's something that if you're developing a product, you're looking out for because yep. it's way too expensive to develop something that yeah, you don't yeah, resistance point. to straight away because you've lost your markets. Yeah. So it's everybody's really thoughtful about that. And actually, it's some information you should put into your dossier as to the likelihood of resistance developing and, okay. and that's usually based on the complex mode of action. Okay, great. Okay, so Roma, thank you so much. Once again, a fantastic presentation, uh, a huge amount of information uh, shared and we will be sharing this with everyone so don't, you don't have to memorize uh, everything. We, we have the recording and we will be also circulating all the resources and links, but thank you so much for your really careful development of the series because we still have two more to go uh, and the presentation today. Um, we're really grateful for you um, to actually have this knowledge shared and I think it's a really good platform for discussion going forward. So next week we have human safety. So I'm, I'm really um, quite interested to hear that uh, that that's, that presentation uh, as well, because it's really going to build on this one. Thank you to all the participants. Um, we'll be following up with all your questions, um, also circulating some documents. Um, I'll be in touch personally. Um, it's, it's great to have you here. I really want to hear from the regulators as well as the applicants. I, I think it's what, what Roma was saying, building trust, but bringing people together and having a dialogue around what works and what doesn't and what are some of these barriers and what are the things that work well as well so we should give ourselves a pat on the back for those things as much as try and work out how we can make improvements um, please join us next week for human safety um, we're looking forward to to that event already and um, once again thank you everyone and please keep safe uh, Roma thanks okay thank you all yeah look forward to meeting you next week <laughs> thanks guys <laughs>